Okay, so today we are speaking about Shalach Lecha, sending for yourself. Shalach is the word that uh, is in the Hebrew it means to send forth. The apostles were also called Shalachim, those who are sent with a purpose. The words at the end there is for yourself. And uh, we find in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 1, um, it speaks about um, we, the report back after everything has happened a generation later. Then Moses says to the nation, you have sent for yourself. Um, out of your own will and ideas, you've uh, sent spies to look at the land. So so the reason why um, we... F- well, this is a little bit of a problem, because remember the this... This incident of the spies that sent out into the promised land is linked to the event of the ninth of Av. That is, that is one of the days and dates in uh, Israel's history that is met with horror. And throughout all of the history, with the destruction of the first temple, the destruction of the second temple, the so many incidents in the new history up to the modern age where um, Hitler and his friends spoke certain things over the Jewish nation. All of them were done on a spe- sort of on a specific date. And it's on the date that the spies were sent out. So, which is interesting. And um, so, I think this is a time where the father in his wisdom wanted to give a gift to Israel. Remember the gift that uh, that uh, Israel was to receive, the nation of Israel? It was uh, spoken to Abraham back in uh, Genesis 15. There was a gift that was promised to the children of Israel. What was the gift that was promised? Eretz, Israel, Eretz, Canaan, actually, as it says here. And there were actually three things. It is, um, and the father wanted to, to uh, establish a relationship between the nation of Israel, between the land of Israel, and himself. There is a there is a strong connection there that the Father is establishing, and right from the time of Abraham that is that is said to be the case. And throughout history we see this relationship of Israel functioning he or via he or um <laughs> in the land of Israel uh, functioning in uh, in in Israel and the land, functioning together, and there was sometimes there were peace, and Israel functioned in great uh, blessing and a time of prosperity in the, in the land, and at other times when they lost the relationship and the worship of our Father, walking in His ways and obedience, then they were pushed out of the land. And then the nations settled in the land, and when they repented, and their relationship was re-established between our father and the nation, they moved back into the land. So it's an ebb and flow of Israel in and out of the land, depending where they find themselves in the relationship with our father. So this is this is the crux of the matter. It is Israel is the stewards of the land, the nation of Israel, and the na- the land will respond positively to their presence. But when they are not in relationship with our Father, then they're expelled from the land. That is the basis of it. So, so this is um, the gift that the Father has given Israel. Is this wonderful promise that was right from the beginning in the days of Abraham, where, uh, where it was said. And there are actually two portions that are closely linked together. Remember back to the portion where uh, Abraham was sent out. What was the name of that Torah portion? Lech Lecha. And this is Shalach Lecha. So go for yourself and send for yourself. Those two are, are linked quite a bit together. So, and um, if we think about the word for giving, the giving of the gift, what is the, word, the Hebrew word for giving? What do you, what do you think? It is noten is the noun, as far as I know. The giving is uh, the verb is natan. The, the the noun, as far as I know, is noten. And this is what back in, um, where is this? Genesis 1 verse 17 about. What was the purpose of, of the luminaries? The purpose of the heavens, the stars, and the sun and the moon? One of the purposes was to shine and give light on the earth. There were other purposes in 14 as well, giving of uh, signs and seasons, etc. 
But the giving of the light of the luminaries unto the earth started at a certain day, the fourth day of creation. And it's with us still today. So the, when the Father says that he is giving a gift to Israel, they are perma- there's, there is permanence linked to this gift. And it is still the case. And it depends on our relationship with him. So, Jeremiah 31, I think it's around about verse 35, it says, As the sun and the moon are visible in the sky, so my relationship with Israel will last forever. So the so these evidences and, and uh, testimonies are always with us. So, um, I should have just paid forward and you would have seen it. So, Numbers 13.2 says, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. It's always astounded me that it is the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan. Where does the name come from? Where is the land of Canaan? Canaan, where does it come from? One of the sons of Noah, the grandson of Noah. Actually, it was the son of Ham. Who was the son that was cursed? Ham. Oh, no, actually, the grandson, Canaan. So why it's named, uh, I'm seeking wisdom. Does anyone have, here have wisdom why the land was called the land of Canaan when Canaan was the one that was cursed? Anyone with wisdom? I'm still seeking the answer. I haven't got the answer to that one yet. So, I think um, if we read this, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. There are a couple of words that is prominent. Firstly, we know that this shalach lecha is, what does this say in the Hebrew? It is um, shalach lecha, or shalach, anashim, atur, or vitur actually, eretz, Canaan, uh, asher, ani, noten, bene Israel. So, more or less the Hebrew in that. So it is, um, the word for spy is tour. It's like a tourist. So if you go to Canaan, you're going on a tour. Okay? So that's how it works. You're not, you're going, and if you have gone to Canaan, and I've been there in 2019, it feels like yesterday, it was five years ago, you come back, what is your message? It is of wow, what has our father done? This is, this is the message that we want. And um, I think it is. I think it's noticeable that the father, right in the beginning of this message, right in the beginning, when they come to the place of Kadesh Barnea, what is what is it that he says? He says, to, "There is a place that I've given you. The end result is already stated. Do you have faith in this message? I have given you this place. Yes or no? Yes, I've given it to you." All right, so that is not negotiable. That is done already. The Father has given us the good news already. So to whom is this offered though? Who is that offered to? It is the children of Israel. And it's, it is usually when, when there is something hugely stated in the covenant basis, is usually linked from, from Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, etc. But this is to the children of Israel. So, I was just wondering in preparation, if it, is, if it says the children of Abraham or the children of Isaac, what, what is the connotation then? What would that mean? Does that differ in, in the message that it's giving to the, to then rather to the children of Israel? Is there a difference in... Okay, all right. So, if it says to to the children of, Ab- of Abraham, then it is said, on the basis of the covenant of Abraham, that says, in chapter 15, 13, somewhere it says, Abraham, good news and bad news. The first thing is, the children will be carried away. The good news is, they will come back in 400 years. Okay? So now they are coming back. So that uh, the original steward, the original covenant is made with Abraham, to, with the land. So that is their testimony and their history that are connected to the land. But now the children of Israel has got an active role to play from hence on forward. So I think this is might be one of the reasons, I don't know, one of the reasons why the children of B'nai Israel stands there. It is because they not only rely on what has been promised and what has been given, but from here on forward they've got a responsibility and things that needs to be done. Have you got a mic there? 
Yeah, okay. Dink oor die Kanaan story incident, hoekom was die land van Kanaan? Um, mm-hmm. Ek dink Kanaan het land gevat wat vader nie vir hom gegeet nie, so dis nie wettige besitting wat gevat word by iemand en vir Israel gegeet word nie. Vir hom is gesê, hy gaan sy broers dien, hy is nooit gesê, hy kan grond besit en een koninkryk bouw nie. So dis nie kom en gaan steel die land by een ander volk en ek maak dit jylle sin nie. Dit is vir die land wat nog altyd vir jylle bestem was. Okay. Wat Kanan gevat het wat nooit kom bedoel was. Nie. Ok, yeah, because it says that um, Gham, or then Kanan, will dwell in the tents of Shem and Japheth. So if he's dwelling in their tents, it means that he's living in the land. But but there's, there's another point to this, and that is, um, uh, our father says, in Leviticus somewhere, he says, the iniquity of the Amorites are not yet full. So it's not yet time. Until the uh, iniquity and or the sin of, one of the, the Amorites are full, then you're moving into the land. So why? What is what bearing does the sin of the, the Amorites have on their presence in the land and their expulsion of it? Remember, the land belongs to our Father. This land of Israel belongs to our Father, and if you're a responsible steward, if you live in His presence, uh, obeying His word, His live out His character, the essence of His character, you're welcome in the land. If you are not in covenant relationship with him and you don't obey his word and his ways, you will be expelled from the land. And we saw that in Canaan's life, we saw that in Amorite's life, and we've seen in Israel's life. Okay. So. Okay, so the gift was offered to those who will take hold of it. Those who will walk in the reality of the covenantal promise, but does stand in a place where they will have the courage and the commitment to take hold of the land of Israel. Okay, so, some will have it, some won't have it. So we see this generation, this generation that is now standing at the border, ready to take hold of it, will eventually refuse the offer, which is amazing, but true. So, what is the reason for them refusing the offer, you think? I thought... They are freed slaves. So that this there is an identity to their lives, being freed slaves. They come out of Egypt, they know what slave masters and powerful people look like, and when they see and identify them, the old fear, the brokenness, the hardships, everything will probably kick in again, and their identity of being freed slaves will remain. So you're either a freed slave, or you're a son of a daughter of the king. One of the two. And I think in our lives we migrate from the one to the other. As we come out of slavery in Egypt, it is important for us not to remain, or keep our identity as being freed slaves, but our identity needs to be changed in the son of a daughter of the king. So, I think someone mentioned it, I think Lowe mentioned it, it's different from living in the house to being a son and a daughter that takes responsibility. So, it's our responsibility. So, am I quoting that more or less right? I think so. Hope so. So, what stumbling blocks caused them not to enter? These guys, these people that were standing at, apart from the message that was given to the, to the, uh, from the spies to the nation. What was this, what was the stumbling blocks that, that stopped them from not entering? Fear. fear. Yes, fear of man. And why would fear reign in your life if you are a son and a daughter of the Most High and you see His presence right here in your midst? Your eyes are taken off from the goal. You're not in a living relationship with Him. You take His presence for granted. And you don't realize who He is in your life. So, so this is the lovely country of Paran, more or less. This is a photo of the hospitable place, a place that... <laughs> I was actually waiting for that comment. So it looks a bit like Otsuren. <clears throat> but, um, <laughs> so, so this is, this is the desert areas. It's to the southeastern side of, um, of Israel, and it's a very dry, arid sort of place that, um, is not known for sustaining life quite well. So, what do we know of Paran? 
Paran, we see the, I think one of the times that we see it is 12, 16 of Numbers. It says, after the people departed from Hatzarot, where they were camping before, and now they camped in the wilderness of Paran. And from the testimony in Deuteronomy, we know that they were at Kadesh Barnea in Paran. That's where they were. So if we look at where the word comes from, Paran, the Paran, the word comes from Pe'alevresh, Pa'ar, and it means to glorify and to beautify, to adorn. A lot of potential there to do it. <laughs> what do you think? So the Father calls us to a place, sometimes, to a place like that, to glorify, to beautify, to adorn it with... What is the word adorn? I'm just thinking of it now. Do you recognize that word? There's another word for that in the Hebrew, and it's the word adi. It's to adorn yourself as a bride adorns herself with jewels. And uh, that is the word Adi, where the word, it's the same root for the word Moedim, it's the same word for Ed, which is witness. Lots of connotation to that word adorning. So as we are adorning ourselves as a bride, we are clothing ourselves with His beauty and His glory. That's what we are doing. But there's another side to this as well, and that is the PL form, and it is, or the Eid PL form, it is to get glory to oneself and to be glorified. That is another application of this. So, this is something that you would not like to do in a place like that. Okay, so, there was this young man, Ishmael. Ishmael is the first resident that we know of, of this lovely place called Paran. We read about it in 20, Genesis 21.20 and it says, And if uh, Elohim was with the boy, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness, and he became an archer, and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, he and his mother took a wife from uh, for him from the land of Mitzrahim. A bit earlier, also in Genesis, it says of who this young man is going to be. It says, um, he is to be a wild man, and his hand is against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and to dwell over against all his brothers. So, what we see in Ishmael's life is, um, is from a time where he made a choice against his father Abraham, his, his, um, the household that he was living in, and he responded in a way that uh, caused him to be expelled from the, from the camp. Because remember, this is what happened to Ishmael's life. Is he was, at the, at the age of a young man, he was... Um, He's probably a young man at that stage when uh, Isaac was weaned. He uh, he mocked Isaac, and he his uh, his response and his actions was such that he was thrown. Him and his mother was thrown out of the camp. And so what uh, what happened is, as he was living in this place outside of the camp of Abraham, um, a father was with a young man because he's still a son of Abraham. And uh, he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. Why didn't he dwell in Israel? Why not in Israel? It was not as if Abraham was the only resident in Israel. Remember, uh, the, the Hittites, the Perizzites, all sorts of ites. And um, who's the guy that they had a battle with that Abraham gave Sarah to in Israel? I forgot his name now. Forgot his name. Who's the name of the king that uh, that Isaac had a battle with as well? It's Avimelech, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, thank you. So there were lots of residents in Israel, not only uh, Abraham and his family. So why didn't Ishmael remain in Israel? Why did he choose this lovely place called Paran to live there? Wonder why? Pardon? Okay, so there's an interesting point. What about the covenantal relationship? Did he have a, did he have a value to the covenant? Did he put any value in the covenant that our father had with Abraham? We saw the same in, 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 um, in Jacob and Esau's lives, where Jacob was for the covenant, for all of the things that our, that our father went, uh, walked away with Abraham, that he embraced Esau not so much. And it's interesting that Edom, uh, Esau went to Edom, outside of the nation of Israel as well. So, so what happened with Ishmael is, just a disclaimer here, there's not a demon called Ishmael's spirit. 
Okay, I just need to say that because sometimes people create an idea that I'm talking about a sort of a demon called Ishmael spirit. That's not the case. This is just a trait that Ishmael lived his life out in, in the way that he presented himself and who he was in him. And I think it is to do with uh, this uh, attitude that he lived his life and that got him banished outside of the camp of Abraham because he didn't live for the values that Abraham uh, sort of embraced. He was an unhappy character that uh, was ungrateful for what was done to him and all of those things that uh, that happened is he got his from his mother because remember his mother had a bad relationship with uh, Sarah and um so i think i think there is a there's a risk that as you grow up in a household and you're exposed to people in the household you can develop a character whether godly or ungodly like the people in the that is living in this this uh, house so we need to make a decision at some stage in your life Am I going to live a godly life? Am I going to submit my life to our Father and His ways? Or am I going to carry on with the ways that my mother Hagar did? His mother Hagar did. Alright, so. So Ishmael. Let's continue with Ishmael for just a second. It says, And as Isaac, the child, Isaac, grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day, that Isaac was weaned. Sounds like the two brothers in, uh, you know, it sounds like the brother that went away, came back. Florician. As the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham had a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned, Sarah saw, saw the son Hagar, the son of Hagar, the Mizrite, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. So she said to Abraham, Avraham, Drive out the female and servant and the son, for the servant, uh, for the son of the female servant shall not inherit with my son, with Isaac. So that might be one of the reasons why they left Israel. The covenantal relationship was not to inherit as with Isaac. But I do think there is now a choice presented before Ishmael. What could he have done? What could have Ishmael's re- response to the situation be? What could the relationship be uh, with him and Abraham from that point forward? What's the options on the table? Restoration. restoration. What's the first point in the restoration? So, I'm sorry, Dad. I made a mistake. You know, there's this relationship between me and Isaac. Things are not always the way it should be. Ask forgiveness. Restore me to the family. What do you think Abraham would have done? Yes, for sure. There's always time for restoration. Every time there's time for restoration. But as he made the decision to walk away, he turned around, he walked away from the camp. Him and his mom, they lived in Paran, and when there was a bride to be chosen, they didn't go to where, they, where Abraham's family is. They chose an Egyptian lady as a bride. So they left for Paran, the so they rejected the land that was promised to Abraham. They rejected the nation that Abraham was living in. Everything that Abraham stood for, it were, they rejected. Yet the Muslims of this day is called the sons of Abraham. It's quite interesting. So, okay. So you get the picture. What I'm saying is we are now, Israel has entered a place called the wilderness of Paran. All right? Now, as we are entering for 400 years, probably so, Ishmael, 400 years ago in the days of Abraham, he came to be, and he lived in this, in this land for a couple hundred years now, 400 years. So what is the potential for Ishmael and his household to influence the character, the ideas, the, the spirit of the land? Think about this. South Africa is about 400 years since the days of Umyan. So, and we have pop- succeeded in populating this place and changing it, you know. So, so Israel is in the in the wilderness of Paran at the moment, and subjected to the ideas, the spirit, the atmosphere that was created for so many years. So, so yes, I said he chose a wife from Egypt. All right. So, okay. So. Um, Seeing that Israel is now here in this 
land, this country, this wilderness. Because remember, they, as we read this morning in the, in the Torah portion, they went from Chatzarot, where they camped, left Sinai, they're away from this harmonious sort of existence with our father at a mountain of Sinai. It's a hiccup one or two. But that existence is now way behind us. We are now in a new country, new challenges. So, and I think for us in our existence in this day, in this age, I think we are faced with a couple of new challenges in our lives. The atmosphere has changed. Things are not always as they seem. You know, in this new life, in this, for, for the last year or two, three, I mean, for many years so, but I think it's, uh, it has intensified quite a bit, is uh, nothing is ever quite as it seems to be. Truth has died. If you look in the news, if you look in social media, if you look in wherever you want to look, there's always an agenda of the people that's telling the story, and you never know right from wrong what's true, what's untrue. You've got to sort of read between the lines and trust our Father for interpretation. So it's always a difficult thing. And this is one of the character traits of Paran. And it's interesting to me, as, as we are moving into this Torah portion and we're speaking about these realities, this sort of problems are sticking out its head in our community and in our own lives. You know, these types of things are coming out. So it's just we are living in the times of Paran at the moment. And um, we have to watch out for all the hidden stuff, the things that you don't expect to pop up in our lives. Because the last thing that we want is to exhibit some of Ishmael's traits in our own lives. That's the last thing we want. So we need to be careful because as you go into a foreign country and you read the signboards, it's difficult to understand. Because they are either in Italian or in whatever language the, the country is following in. And as you go into this area of the wilderness, things are different from what we are used to. So, what are the signs of Ishmael at work? And if we, and I got this from looking at the, the ideas of Hagar, his mother, in her dealings with, with the household of, of uh, Abraham and, the, and Ishmael's own dealings. As a, a mocking spirit as he exhibited with a, with Isaac. Hagar was a little bit argumentative. We see that the promise of our father that says he will be a wild donkey of a man. He will have his hand against his brothers and his brothers' hands against him. His attitude towards Isaac devalues the, the, in those who inherit the land. Choosing foreign ways over the ways of Adonai. Entitlement, a sense of entitlement is, is part of the character trait. Entitlement is a difficult thing to deal with. Because how do you view your own life in relationship to your brothers and sisters and their father? And as you view your own life, you sort of make up your mind. And you sustain this ego that you've built around you with all, with all sorts of ideas. So we need to trust our brothers and sisters to deal with that thing in our lives. And yourself, you won't be able to deal with it. So... So this is more or less the topography of Canaan. And uh, do you see the 12 spies in Canaan? No, you can't see them very well because they're hidden. So spies are not meant to be out in the open. It's a clandestine operation. So as they are camped down, there is Cardius Bernia, it says down there. I think it's a little bit more down there where they camped. But they, from there they travel to land for how many days? 40 days. They traveled the land for 40 days and they came back with a message. What should the message be? Have you read the name? I know Christian were battling through the names this morning of the 12 spies when we read the Torah portion. Have you looked at the names? If you read the names, think about the expected message from these names. Shamua, the one who hears. Shafat, the judge. Kalev, oh, there's uh, two, two interpretations. Kalev can be a dog. What is a dog's normal uh, character towards his owners? Loyalty. All that beautiful things that is associated with a dog, but also brave. 
So the, this is a police guard dog. Anyway, so a dog, Egal who redeems, Yehoshua, Adonai saves, Palti is the deliverer, Gadiel, God is my fortune, Gadi is my fortune, Amiel is my kinsman, is Adonai, Setur is hidden, the son of Michael, who is, who is like Adonai, Navi is the prophet, or, or a hidden prophet, Guel is majesty of our father. What sort of a message do we expect from these guys? A negative message? What is the trend? What is that sort of... If you sum that up in a sentence, what does that morally say? These are the heads of the tribes that were selected. They're all about 40 odd years old. They were selected to bring a message of hope, encouragement of the goodness of our Father that says that He is our Redeemer. He will save us. He is our fortune because our because our kinsman is Adonai, he will save us. And there's a prophetic word in there, is that it was given to Abraham, our father, that this will be the land that we are inheriting. So, take heart, guys. The majesty of Adonai is with us. Who can be against us? That's the message we expect. So, what was the mission? Numbers 13, 17 says, Moshe sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. So it doesn't, isn't really clear here that it says, Shalach Lecha, you sent for yourselves. But it says in verse 17, Moshe sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and he said to them, Go up here into the south and go up into the mountains and see what the land is like and the people who dwell in it, whether they are strong or weak, few or many, and whether the land they dwell in is good or evil, whether the cities they inhabit are the camps and strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not, and you shall be strong, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of first fruits of grapes. What time of the year was this? First fruits of grapes. Sukkot. It was Sukkot. The harvest of the grapes is in the time of Sukkot. Okay, so... So this is a time of celebration. This is a time where we know in our lives, as we expect it to be, is as we are going from the, the season, the time, the life that we are in, into the, the kingdom of Messiah, it will happen at the time of Sukkot. Okay, that's why when we celebrate Sukkot every year, it is the theme of our whole story. And this is the, the entry into the promised land. Okay, so it is time, yes, it is all good. So what is um, the purposes? Well, if we sum up that, uh, that text, what are they to do? What, is, what are they um, doing? Is they should explore and map out the terrain of the land. Why is this necessary? Remember, the, the, the pillar of cloud followed them throughout the wilderness. Oh, they followed the pillar of cloud and fire in the wilderness. What will happen when they cross the Jordan? Then the pillar of cloud disappears. The Father is with them and he will, he will conquer the land for them. But Moshe said, explore the map of the, the layout, the layout of the land. So take note of the land and report on the fruitfulness of the land. Bring back some first fruit. Bring back of its fruit. Why is it necessary to bring back some fruit? To see if it's good, if the fruit tastes good, is it bad, is it necessary, is it worthwhile going up? Is that the reason? Think about it. Report on the people found inhabiting the land. So, if we look at these things, oops, Daisy, if we try to look at them in any case, is this a feasibility study? Is this a study to say, is it even worthwhile going up into this land? Is the gift that our Father giving us, is it a good gift? The people that live in the land, is this a military report to say, are we able to even take them? It's not that. It's, it was never meant to be that. Remember the names? The twelve names of the guys? What was the purpose of this thing? What was the purpose of this whole effort? Supposed to be? It is to go, go, see how good and wonderful this gift is. Return, bring some souvenirs, bring some stuff to make us happy and encourage us to enter this land with goodness and gladness. So, 
We know this promise is true, and we know it's been established in our Father's heart, and it's said to be eternal. And we find it back in Genesis 15, as we said in Abraham's day, when this was the, the, the subject of the promise. Your children will be going to a foreign land, yes, just in a matter of 400 years. They will return, and they will live in the land. That's the good news. And in Exodus 13, in these days, in, in these guys' lives, remember this is the generation where it's been said to, and uh, Adonai says, I am bringing you up out of the affliction of Mitzrayim to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the otherites and the Jebusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey. So what will the, what will the land look like? It will be a land of provision, a good place, and Extreme abundance, where you will live a life in my presence, and life will be tovmeot. Very good. They knew it, it was said to them. Okay. So, the reason for sending the spies could never be to determine the value of the gift. Could never be that. So, I think these two things was part of the stumbling blocks. It's in our own lives and in their lives. We need to, we need to decide. What is reigning superior in your life? Faith and trust in our Father or reason and logic? And is the two separated? Is, is reason and logic separated from faith and trust? What do you think? Is it? If we can reason together, the Father invites us. He says, come reason with me. And, the things, the values, what the Father presents before us is always logical. It's always, well, not always logical, but it's always reasonable and the Father lays it out and it's good to do. So, But the problem is, the, it's the problem of control in your life and in my life. What reigns supreme? Do you make our decisions based on faith and trust? Or do you make our decisions on reason and logic? When it abandons the ideas and the values that faith and trust in our Father presents. And I think this is this is what happened to these guys, is that um, they exchanged the one for the other. So, what is the vision that our, that our father gave them in the in in sitting in Kadesh Barnea? What was their purpose? Prepare yourselves. Joshua and Caleb says, "Come, guys, let's stand up. Let's go. Let's take this land. It's ours for the taking." So, this is the vision that was for them. What's the vision that the father is giving us? What, do, what is it that he is preparing us for? Prepare your lives. Be washed with the word and the spirit so that your lives, that you are prepared as the bride of Messiah so that when we are entering into the promised land, we are ready, we are prepared so that we can take it in as they were preparing themselves to go into the land of Israel. So, the only issue is if we don't think of ourselves to be ready, if we don't think of ourselves to be fully prepared, then we can change the goalposts. We can change things as we go. Because it's not based in faith and trust in what the Father says. This relies on what we think to be true. And whenever that starts to happen and that starts to uh, become a thing in your life, then, um, then our thoughts and our emotions and our experience starts to become the, de the deciding factors. And then we're in trouble. So James 2 verse 9 says, You believe that our Father is one, you do well. Great. So do the demons. We need to act upon the word that the Father has given us. You know? So so yes, you've done well. You sit in Kadesh Barnea, you're part of the household. Are you willing to take up the responsibility and whatever the Father has deposited in your life to move forward? This is the This is the question. Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. So, these are the choices that we presented to them. So, so let's think about um, the ten spies. Ten spies, what is the time like? Let me, let me just have a look. What's the time? The time is now only 20 past 11, and we have until at least after 12, Waiting for Eskim. I've got a, I've got a good excuse today. We're waiting for Eskim so that the kitchen can start doing its thing again. So, so relax. If you feel tired, raise your hand 
quickly and then we'll have a quick one second break. Okay, so the problem is with these guys is through which lens did they view the mission? What did they think of? Were they responsible uh, leaders of tribes that were only looking out for the people and they tried their very best from their own region and logic to go up in a responsible way? Because what of our children? This, that was the question. What will happen to our children? Those guys have got biceps like you can't believe. You know, this is the problem. And then afterwards the father said, I will take your generation out, but only your children will go in. So, the promised gift is viewed through a, our, our experience and our viewpoint. What do we think and what we know of the Father? And sometimes our understanding of Him is limited. And through our own testimony, we limit His, we limit Him in our lives. That's dangerous. This is what they did. So, so they reasoned together and in their weak self-image, it's probably that overpowered their faith. The ten guys. And they couldn't stand up boldly before a nation and say, yes, things are not so rosy where we are going, but we are able to take it with our Father. That's what it is. Let's just go. And they weren't able to do that because of fear. They saw problems and impossibilities wherever they looked. They looked at the size of the people and the walls and they imagined the worst case scenarios. Which generation are we talking about here? Are we talking about them or are we talking about this generation? You know, think about this. Look at our experience. Look at our own experience right now and where do we put our focus? And we might just as well lose our single focus ideas on on the purpose that the Father has called us and look at what the world is doing and become so confused that we become irrelevant in this generation. Fear, doubt and unbelief. What is the name for fear, doubt and unbelief? It's associated with Amalek. And it says Amalek will be with you throughout all your generations. Amalek is well and alive among us. And we shouldn't give him a voice to speak. We should not voice his ideas, because those ideas are Amalek's ideas. So, in the end, they say, let's be like Ishmael. Let's appoint a leader. Let's go back to, Ishmael, to Ishmael's wife, to the parents-in-law. And let's go stay there. It was safer back then. Let's be slaves. We are redeemed slaves. Let's just go back to our slavery like we knew. But they were two young men. They were 40 years old, I read, more or less. Yehoshua and Kalev. And um, I think when they, when they left Egypt and they came on this mission this last year or so, it was with one goal in mind, apart from worshipping our Father and the relationship with our Father. But it's for the promise, the goal. And they, everything they did was in preparation for that. And when they came back with the report that they brought, I think they had something on David. You know, you remember when he came back with the Ark of the Covenant, bringing back in the glory that he experienced? I think that was where, where they were at. They were smiling from ear to ear and they were dancing and they were happy because of where they were going. They couldn't speak to... It is, it's interesting to me if you read the text. It says, And Caleb silenced the community. How big was the community? Three million people odd. I can't even silence a hundred people if I try. It is with the help of a microphone. They were standing in front of a nation and with a message that they gave, they silenced the community and they listened, but they didn't take it to heart because the voices of the ten were already overpowering their ideas. They say, rise up and follow Adonai and let's take possession of the land. It's ours for the taking. For 400 years now, there's been a promise in place for us to do this today. It's a sad story if you, because of a report that someone gives you via WhatsApp or whatever other means, you fail to take up the promised land. And you lose heart because of the sad and bad news around you. So, 
What's that? So yeah, there, there is an answer. Let's, let's not go with what the majority says. If the majority says do this, let's not do that, maybe. Let's just reevaluate our place. So, who was your, your Hoshua? Your Hoshua, the son of Nun, was a, I think the, what was the first time? When was the first time that we heard of him? When was the first time that we heard of him? Can you remember, maybe? Let's just think. When Moses went up the mountain, he took a young man with him. It was Joshua. And from there, then on forward, Joshua was walking with Moses. And it says at the time, uh, Exodus 33, when, when the golden calf incident had just taken place and, and Moses couldn't take it any longer, and he took the, the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting inside, and he, he, he pitched it outside of the camp. Yeah, Joshua went with him. And when even when Moses left the tent after speaking to our father and he went back, Joshua remained. He had a heart and a commitment to our father like none other. So this was the young man that was set up. and that. Um, but his, only his name was not Yehoshua. His name was Hoshia. Okay, so, so Hoshia, how do you spell Hoshia? How it were? <laughs> Thank you for that bit of wisdom. I really appreciate that wisdom. It's a hey, a shin, uh, probably a vav, a yin. Is there a vav in there? I think so. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. So what happened is, before they left, what did Moses do to the name of Oshua? Oshia? How? He put a yod in there. He said, You are a son of Abraham and Sarah. This is what happened. And back with a promise that uh, Sarah is going to have a child. What happened to Sarah's name? It changed. It was changed from Sarai to, to, to Sarah. The Yod disappeared from Sarai's name. So based on that covenantal promise, what happened to Joshua? Let's take that Yod and let's put it in there and make you a son of the covenant. The son of Sarai, Abraham and Sarai. Who, who else? Yes. Yehoshua. No, I, I think I'm right. This is this is the name of Yehoshua, Yotation Vav Ain. Hoshia was Haitian Vav Ain. I think so. What is it? What is it rendered in your scripture? Uh, uh, probably. I think you're right there. Sli partially right. Partially, maybe. Maybe it's like this. Marike help her, now she can Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this disappears there. And it comes in there. Hoshua. Hoshia? Marike, is it right? No, it's on the Baidin nodig hier so. Anyways. I think we should look for ourselves. Let's just let's just look at the situation that presents itself here, and we'll and we'll render it from scripture. See, it's confirmed that I'm right. <laughs> so, so it is. So Hoshia's name changed from from this Hoshia to, and I think the wife stayed there, Yehoshua. Yehoshua. So what about Yeshua's name? Where does Yeshua's name fit in there? Because this is more or less the same name that... This is the Hebrew rendering of Yehoshua, and then Yeshua came along. Yehoshin Vav Ayin. This is Yeshua's name. Okay? Yod, that's the Ye. Ye, Shin, with a, with a U, 
Because remember, if there's a little call, call a ooh, and if there's a call, it's a oh. Okay? So, it's yes, and ooh, ah. Yeshua. Why is it different from Yehoshua, just while we're on the subject? Why is Yish- the son of the Most High not called? Because what is the name? What does this name mean? What does this name Yehoshua mean? A father, because that's the first character of his name as well. Our father saves. Okay, so it would have been a fitting name for our Messiah, don't you think? Why is the name changed from this to there? What do you think? The one is Aramaic and the other one is Hebrew. So it's a trick question. So Yeshua, living in an Aramaic community, has an Aramaic name. Yeshua, but it has got the same meaning than what Yeshua means. Okay. So, so the, the yod there, or that yod there, is a sign of an arm, of a hand, of an arm. And it holds on to whatever is next to it. What is next to it? Saves. Our Father will save. So, our Father will save the nation. So, who else in the family has a yod in front of the name? What about Yosef? Uh, Yehuda, Yisrael, seems like most of them have got that. It's interesting. So, so the Yod was removed from Sarah's name because Sarai, as I said there, was a Yod. Sarai was changed with a Hay. That makes, makes it Sarah. So the Yod is removed. A, a Hay is entered. And now uh, Yehoshua is as an example of being in that covenant, is added with a yod, I think. So, so these guys, Yitzchak, oh yes, I forgot about him. Yitzchak, Yaakov, Yisrael, Yosef, Yuda, all of them has got a yod that they begin with. And um, I think in this, in this stage, Yehoshua was elevated to become a symbol or a forerunner of the Messiah, the, that will come 2000 or a couple of years later. All right. So, so Matthew, so it's interesting uh, connection. Matthew 5, 17 to 18 says, till heaven and earth pass away, not one yod shall in no way pass from the Torah till all be fulfilled. So every detail is important. So I, we have discussed why it's a yod. So, so Yoshua is leading to the promised land. Exodus 33.11 says, this is the first time we really see him in action, apart from him uh, worshipping in the uh, oil moed. Exodus 33.11 says, his servant Jehoshua, the son of Nun, the young man, did not leave the tent. This is his worship. And now in Joshua 1, just uh, I think it's in Joshua 1 when it started. I need to be careful now because people are checking what I'm saying, it seems. Um, so... It says in Joshua 1, it says, Our father says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, Joshua, arise. Go over the Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even the children of Israel. And then in Joshua 1, 6, it says, Be strong and courageous, for you are to let this people inherit the land I swore to, the, to their fathers to give to them. So this Joshua that is now raised up in front of the community that brings, he's the, at about the year, at about the age of 40, he's bringing the message of the good news. He says, rise up. Together we will take the promised land. There's a generational delay. One generation, there's a delay because of unbelief and of fear and of all of those ideas. But now, a generation later, he says, be strong and courageous, for you are to let his people inherit the land. This is in the life of Joshua. So my prayer is really that we will not, as a generation that we find ourselves in today, the atmosphere in the believing community today is like the second generation that says, yes, let's stand, let's rise together, let's take the, the promises, the, the ideas, the values of the promised land of what our Father has presented to us, and let this, let us proceed with purpose 
And let us bear the testimony of the good news so that the nations will follow us and that they will start to worship our Father and together we can embrace the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So that we will not be like the first generation but like the second generation. So, Okay, so, sorry, that text went on, I forgot to say, to be only to be strong, Joshua, only to be strong and very courageous. It's not, it's not, not only anymore be strong and courageous, it says only be very strong and courageous to guard and to do according to all the Torah which Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it right or left, so that you act wisely wherever you go. So how do we inherit the promised land? How do we get there? First step, a covenantal relationship with our Father, through the person of Messiah. That's the only hope and the only ways you and I are included in the family. And then when we are there, be very strong and courageous and guard to do all according to which I commanded Moses, my servant, and do not turn from it left or right, so that you act wisely wherever you go. And as you are proclaiming the good news of the Messiah, and as you are embracing all of the values that Messiah has given us, then the good news of the kingdom will spread over the globe, and we will make ourselves ready, as Ephesians says, as Messiah is washing and preparing us as a bride, adorned for her husband. So, that was Joshua. What about Caleb? We hardly ever speak about this young man without a moustache. So, he had a collab. You see? So, he was a man that had a heart of loyalty. He was a loyal man that, that had a, a name that says, that spoke to his loyalty and his, and his brave heart. Let's just read this. This is worthwhile reading. And I'm taking long today because Eskim. Okay. Remember Eskim. If you think of blaming me, uh, Hosea 14. Oh, that's, yes. Hoshea, Joshua. Where am I now? I almost read Hosea. That would have been a mistake. <clears throat> Joshua 14. And the verse is 711. Okay, let me read it because I've got the mic. Who wants to read this? Who's got a... Where is the mic? Hanali, have you got the mic with you? Who's got the scripture? I s can I see a hand? I'm Chris to hear it. See what it offers, please. Joshua 7? No, 14, 7 to 11. Okay, that would have been wonderful too, but yeah. let's read this yeah. one. The seven. It was forty years. Uh, I was forty years old when Moshe, the servant of Adonai, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to reconnoiter um, the land, and I brought back to him an honest report. My brothers who went up with me discouraged the people. But I followed Adonai my God completely. And on that day, Moshe swore, surely the land where your foot has been will be the uh, inheritance for you and your descendants forever. Because you have fulfilled, excuse, because you have followed Adonai my God completely. Now look, Adonai has kept me alive these 40 years. Um, for, uh, these 45 years. And, I, and he said he would, from the time Adonai said this to Moshe, when Israel was given, was going through the desert. Today I am 85 years old. But, but I am as strong today as on the day Moshe sent me. I am as strong now as I was then. Um, whether for war or simply for going here from there, or here and there. Therefore, give me this hill 
the one Adonai spoke about on that day. For on that day, you heard how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps, perhaps Adonai will be with, with me and I will drive them away, as Adonai said. Okay, man, okay. All right, so what do we see in his life? This is Caleb, speaking about Caleb. So, so it says in verse 9, he followed our father completely. He was patient and persevering and strong in this portion. He was a leader in 15, 13 to 19, which we didn't read, because, it, because uh, following on this, it says, Adonai, give me this hill that you have promised me. And then at the, at the age of 85, he went ahead and, and took out giants. So he didn't take out the easy targets. He went for the, because he had experience with our father. He took out the giants. He drove out Anak. And remember Anak, oops, sorry, Anak had a, was in the city of Arba, which is the four. He had four sons with him. So he was a, he was a, a heavy target to take out. And because of Caleb that followed our father, wholeheartedly, for all the years of his life. At the ripe age of 85, he was able to to possess the land as our father promised him to do. So, there are some life lessons we can learn from Joshua and Caleb. Then if we look at their lives, it says, be confident and courageous. Why can we be confident and courageous? Because if we respond or act in a spirit of fear, then we know that we have a little problem with the character that the father, our father's character, who he is as our Adonai, and who we are as his sons and daughters. If we respond in fear, we need to work at that. So we need to be patient and persevere as um, Joshua and Caleb did. We need to be strong in Adonai and the power of his might, Ephesians says. We must be a believer. I was wondering about this quite a bit. Now the idea is, what I was thinking about is, if we are believers, are we, on which side of the fence are we standing? Are we, are we acting as spies for the kingdom? Because we are bringing reports of the kingdom every day. Or are we standing in the life of Israel, equipping ourselves to enter? What do you think? Well, let's, let's talk about this for a second, just because we're waiting for Eskim. What do we do? What do you think? Who, we, who are we? Are we believers on this side of the fence, waiting for a, re, waiting to enter the kingdom as these, as the nation of Israel did? Or are we people with a report of the kingdom, having seen some glimpses of the kingdom coming back and reporting? What do you think? I think we're both. Do you agree? I think, I think we are playing the role of both. There's just a risk in that if we are developing an over-enthusiasm to look at the ideas of the spiritual dimension to which we are not yet to enter, then we can bring back a report that's not true. So, we must follow and walk in the ways of our Father as described in the Word, as described in the Torah, and as the example that these guys have set. So, in everything there's, remember, we are in the territory of Paran at the moment. Everything is not completely as it seems. So therefore, yes, Kerry, uh, your question will be heard through the mic. Have we got the mic? Thank you. It's on. So, no, it's, it's good, you can go. So, Kayla... His whole, he was from the tribe of Judah. Judah. So the whole tribe of Judah went in. Yeah. And um, Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim. So the whole tribe, even the old people. So he was the oldest, by the way. Because remember, the older generations, his generation, they died out. It was only the, the sons and daughters younger than 20, 20 years of age that went with the uh, nation into into uh, the promised okay. land. So, 
So uh, Caleb was about 85 years old, as his testimony is, and Joshua about the same age. The rest were a maximum of 40 years old. No, no, 60 years old. Yes, we mean 60. I said to James Mayer. What if there were some people who agreed with that? Who agreed with? with Caleb and Joshua? I think most of them did. What do you mean now or before? Yeah, I mean before. Oh. Who, who didn't listen to the evil report? Who wanted to go in and they were just automatically... Yeah. They were part of the household, and they were judged because they were part of the household, and they they couldn't enter into the land. That's because what you're saying. Because their leaders, just because their leaders believe in evil report. Remember, okay, let's discuss this. You can just switch that off. So it is. Let's think about this. Uh, what Kerry is saying is that back in the day, back in the first time, first time in Kadesh Barnea, the the leaders came and they gave an evil report, and because of the evil report, they didn't enter the land. Is that what we are? What did the nation say? What was their reaction? What was their reaction? The nation stood up and they wanted to kill Joshua and Caleb and they say submitted to what the evil report was. And there's no, no person mentioned that stood out to make a prominent stance. Remember the first time with the golden calf incident when, um, when uh, there were people that stood out because Moses said, who's for me and for Adonai? And the, and the Levitical tribe stood up and they were, were for him. But in this case, there were no one else that stood up. The only two righteous persons that were found that could enter the promised land, in this case, was Joshua and Caleb. Nothing else in scripture says. No, because, because remember, your inheritance of the promised land depends on your relationship with our Father. Your family will, will not enter the promised land because of your relationship with our Father. You will enter the, the promised land because of your relationship. So if your family believed the evil report in those days, like it seems that they have done, then they will perish in the wilderness too. That's how it is. So, there was something intelligent I was thinking about now, but I forgot it again. It's it's a fleeting moment for me, per, normally. Can I just give this mic to to Rian, please? So the mic off as he goes. Rian, for me, um, what's just interesting is that they couldn't wait for Moses forty days to come down with the tablets or the, the covenant. Yeah. Um, I can see the words, and but they could wait forty days. Forty days for, for the, the spies. spies. Now they had experience. They knew 40 was a good number. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, the, the fruit they brought yeah. was a blessing that the father mm. wanted to show him that when he wanted to give it to him. Mm. But they turned it around and said, this is going to be a curse for him. Remember, we spoke about it this morning, um, Annalena I spoke before we came here, is that they were instructed to look at the fruit of the land and to the country as a whole and to map out so that they can be confident when they go in that they know that the, 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 the country that they are inheriting is a good country and that the fruit is exceptional. Okay? So what were the primary objecti objectives in looking at? It was the country as a whole and the fruit and the layout. But coming back, what was the focus of the report? The people in the country. So suddenly it changed in their focus changed to the people apart from the land. So when we are looking at the behavior of people and make our life decisions based on that, we are going to miss it. Same story. Okay. So what is the life lessons? I think we've gone through most of them. We, oops, Daisy, we, uh, we need to be a believer. That's what we spoke about. And if you go out of this place and you are speaking to a group of people that doesn't know our Father, and you lead them into understanding of who our Father is, then you are a leader. It's not only one or two people or the leadership of a congregation that's signified as leaders. Don't have that misunderstanding in your life. Yes, of this congregation there is a le established leadership, but in our own lives and personal, you are set up as someone that leads someone else by the power of the Spirit into the place of the kingdom. All right. Remain teachable, all of us. That's a key. Because if you think you know it all, you've lost it all. So, 
What is the report that we give? What is the what does the report look like that we give? Is it the enthusiastic report that speaks about our father's power and his character and our ability in the power of his might to enter into the and to walk through this treacherous country of Paran? Or are we looking at what the world's opinion is and changing our opinion accordingly? So I think yes. The incidents of the other spies, which Joshua sent, yeah, and that went to into the promised land. They came. They said, "The fear of the Lord has fallen on." on Correctly. So they gave yeah. a good report. Yeah. So this is they learned a lesson. So what happened is in Joshua when the spies are sent out into Jericho as to spy out the the what happened to them is that although they saw a a wall like none other and they were approached by people that they knew on Rahab's testimony that the, the nation, our nation is filled with fear of what Adonai is doing in your lives. Exceptional. If we live a life in the presence of our Father, although we think and we live our lives and we think it's, we're full of hurts and whatever, other people are looking at us and see the power of the Spirit, yes or no. Tanirina. Yeah, Yobo. Yobo is, is that's it. I think it's right. Can I help you? <laughs> Joshua, are you the culprit? There you go. I was just thinking that the first group who came out of Egypt, they had witnessed what Elohim had done in Egypt. Yes. So when he said to them, I'm giving you this land. I will conquer the enemy. They had that memory. So yeah. they knew who he The power was. of our fathers. And so, yeah. yes, in Egypt there was one enemy. In Hanan, there's six. But what is six? To their enemy, yeah. nothing. Yeah, so, so, what they were actually doing was Lashon Oral mm. against Elohim. And the, the, the support of Han is um, Sahara. Yeah. Which makes you die. Yeah, you, they experience death because of yes, the negative yes, speech yes. about our father. Yeah. 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 So what they chose was, was death. Yeah. So this is the thing. We've got a choice every time that we give a report. If we give a report about how we perceive life to be in our current circumstance, that's a report that we give. Is it the reality of what our Father has installed in our lives? Or is it the reality of what other people says our experience should be? No? This is our choice. You know? Is Klaus Schwab doing the thing? Or is it, is it our Father's authority that we're standing under? So, the testimony is, in 1 Corinthians 12, it speaks about giftings. Oh, I th almost saw that I said 11 giftings. I only know about 9. But it's verse 8 to 11. It speaks about nine giftings. Wisdom, words of wisdom, for purpose of encouraging one another, to bring one another into the presence of our Father, so that in, together, in united, we, saw, saw, we sang about being in unity this morning, and that's the crux. So, we are called, lived, uh, we are called to live lives, to speak words, and to engage in all sorts of actions that speaks about the atmosphere of the kingdom. So, how do we know what the kingdom is like at the moment? And how can we communicate this to people outside? We know what the kingdom and the atmosphere of the kingdom is like because we read about it in Scripture. Because of the experience of a nation through thousands of years has drawn a picture for us so that we understand our Father's character. That's how we understand the kingdom. And if we speak about uh, speak about the kingdom to one or two other people, this is the picture that we draw, not the realities that we see in the news. We are not to slip into aggressiveness, skepticism, sarcasm, and negativity. If we do so, we think about our nephew, and we live out the character traits of Ishmael. 
we should not do so. This is not what the Father is calling us because that's not a t testimony of the kingdom. It takes us back into a place of irrelevance in Egypt. So, so how do we do this? How do we live a life? How do we live a life that is the testimony of our Father's goodness and His grace and His mercy? Actively, every day, although we are standing and facing giants, because they are true, they are there, apparently. You know? so, so, although Israel had a great, as Tanirina just said, they had a great testimony of deliverance from the days of, of um, Egypt when they came out, the plagues, the ten plagues, and everything else. Why did they miss the bus here? Why did they miss this point of entry into the kingdom? They missed this. They missed this, the, the promise and their purpose. And it's mind-blowing how you can be influenced through 40 days of testing. They were waiting, Rian said, they waited 40 days. And in these days, what should they have done? Reveled in the beauty of what the promises that our Father is giving to them. Thinking about how to prepare their own lives, their hearts, to enter into the kingdom. But uh, I think the previous wait of 40 days influenced them to a certain extent and fear for their hearts. So, if you think about your own life, what is the implications of this season that we are in? We are in a season of our modern lives. And I think um, if we think about what's going on in the world, the world, has a, apart from the fuel price, there is greater impact in our lives in terms of the uncertainty and where the financial world, where the spiritual world is heading towards. And how does it, what's the implications for us in this time? And how does it influence us? Does it fill us with doubt? A little bit of fear leading us to unbelief? Because that's Amalek. It should encourage us that we're standing at the border of the promised land. So, what has our Father prepared for us? To be the, be the bearers of the good news. To encourage one another. So that we can teach one another the character of the Father. Helping us to inst instill a message of hope and goodness and mercy and following us every day. So, I think this is a time of, this is a challenging time that we are going in. Because remember, I'm just thinking about this. Remember what happened when Joshua said, Now is the day. Let us go. There was a river in front of them. And the river was in flood, by the way. No way through. So, there are still obstacles in our lives. Johan, there's a mic. Let me just give us, yeah, sorry. So. Yeah, just going back to the fear and the logic, or the or the reason and the logic, uh, from a from personal experience and testimony, I'll keep it concise. But um, we don't realize that the emotions that affect our fear and all our logic and our reason. Yeah. Um, and for many years, struggling with things, and then the picture becomes clearer as we wrestle and struggle with. Uh, with Yah, and he helps us to overcome, realizing that those emotions have names. And once you can coin that emotion, you know, you can actually see what drives yes. your, your your reason and your logic. Ultimately, that flows into your conduct. No. Um, so, you know, that it, it seems logical in the moment you're doing it, or your reaction, especially with reactions in relationships um, and communicating with people, for instance. It feels logical that you're doing, or your reaction is the way yes. it is, but, it, but it's, it's not at all. But it is because not it's right. not grounded in truth, something that is eternal. Mm. It's not grounded in an identity. Mm. Um, and therefore you don't know, with fear you don't know what you don't know, and a whole number of other things are uncertain. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like I say, giving that emotion in your life, uh, dissecting it mm. with the word, and with others, this was a, a major thing. Others explained to me what's happening. Also doing research, experiences of others, 
seeing how some of these things are very much physical in terms of diet, for instance, making a huge difference, and maybe therefore um, the fruit they brought back is maybe some, something we should look at. Not necessarily the food that we know today, but the food that Yah has for us, maybe. That's a, that might be a, a seed that I plant. But diet made a huge difference. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just, you know, you have to, the problem is it gets ingrained. Yeah. So the hormones and the endorphins and all these things. So start everything builds up. That's, this exactly. is the thing, you know. So in, and in your, in your own experience, it seems like it's a logical thing for you to walk exactly. in. Exactly. And, and then you can't so. get out of that behavioral yeah. pattern. So, so how do you, how do you get out of that behavioral pattern and how do you see the light at the end of the day? How do, how does this work in our own lives? And I think this is what, what he raises is a variable point. It's only able, we are only able to identify um, what the light from darkness if we are standing next to another person that can help you to discern. Because if a family is going through turmoil and a family is going through a difficult time, it's difficult for this, for a family to discern light from darkness. No, because it's, it seems logical, it seems to be your experience, but it's not, probably not grounded in the truth of scripture and what these guys should have ex ex uh, explained and lived by. So, and I think this is one of the values that we have in a community. To, to if someone is going through a difficult time and in, and look and looking at uh, at the reality of his life and saying, "I don't know left or right," okay. Several contrasts that, that you've actually highlighted today. So, in terms of the spies, the first contrast is how they've be reacted to the same uh, facts. Yeah. So, the one group has reacted on the one side, and it has resulted in one thing, and the other group has seen has resp uh, responded differently. So, there's a contrast. And the result of the contrast was 40 years longer in the in the in the desert, walking around in the wilderness, and and the death that then went with it, and the and the dividing wall between these two contrasts was the attitude and the 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 mirror, the, the spectacles through which they're actually looking at it, the glasses. But there was also the other contrast was that Hagar and Ishmael they were born in the household of Abraham, and was actually supposed to stay there. Yeah. But then because of the attitude, and, and, and while they were in the household, they were actually to bring glory to our Father. And that's what you've said about Paran. You're either bringing glory and to adorn yourself, or you will seek own self-glorification, but then you're actually sent out. So that place, that Paran, the wilderness, you actually should not see with the physical eyes. You should have spiritual eyes and that's bring glory about. unto the Father. I agree. But because they were now sent out, they were actually now seeing the physical desert wilderness, yeah. the, uh, the desert area around them. But there's this other contrast as well, which is then with respect to Canaan. Because in the sense that Canaan means to be humble. So Canaan, the man, the son of Ham, was not born cursed. No. He was born to be part of the people coming out through the flood and to actually be a witness bearer unto Father's greatness. But the separate part of that is to actually be humbled. So because he was not humble, he was humbled. Yeah. He was humbled. Yes, true. But likewise with Canaan or the land of Canaan, we have to access it. By being humble. By being humble, yeah. But if we are not humble... If we are adorning ourselves and beautifying ourselves... Then you will be humbled. Yes. Which is what happened to, to them for that 40 years. Yes, absolutely. They had to take possession of the gift in humility. Yeah. But then they were humbled. I agree. And so, so you've got these several contrasts, and the difference between these several contrasts is basically just our, our attitude and our... Adoration unto our Father. So this is the thing. How do we view our lives? We've got these two, these two worlds apart. Is do we, do we live our lives? Do we view our lives as being 
servants of the king, established as a son and a daughter so that we can inherit the kingdom and we stand on the promise of the covenants and everything it builds on and we live according to the character traits of our father or have we received a hurt in our lives because that's what Ishmael did. He was the first son, he was raised in the household, suddenly this young man comes along and now suddenly he's the child of the promise and he feels to, he needs to build himself up to something that he wasn't. So, and it's mostly built on hurts and misunderstandings, or not misunderstandings, hurts and that sort of thing that uh, that we land into trouble. This is the problem. Is there any other comments? I think this is, uh, for 38 years, Israel travels in Paran. And it's a land of risks. It's a land of spiritual and physical risks. And for the rest of our Torah portion, from here until Sikot, we're in Paran. So this is a dangerous, treacherous time of the year that we are in. Because I haven't, I don't know if you have noticed, but as we work through these Torah portions, it sort of finds bearing in your own life and you have a little bit of experience in that area. So guard our hearts so that we don't exhibit the character traits of Ishmael. This is a thing. Uh, Ian, can I, last, last comment. Um, what are the, the, I'm going to start with the question, what are the um, similarities between Paran and the wilderness? And then the next thing, I, then I want to make a comment and just say, um, you know, I can with Hosea, thou hast will, wooed me to the wilderness, to um, to the valley of Acre, to betroth me into faithfulness. So if yeah. we are going through the wilderness, this is the time for us to get close to Father. Yeah. So this is, remember the time of tribulation is also signified as a wilderness period. And that the wilderness, uh, the time of tribulation, which is a wilderness, is for the purpose of helping us to f purify our lives and to get us to be humbled and to be put into a position where we can hear His voice. So, we are going to enjoy a good time in the tribulation so that we can learn to function in unity because yes, we are going to need one another more than, than ever before and we're going to walk in humbleness in the face of our Father, in the presence of our Father and so that together we can stand as the bride that overcame, washed by the blood of the Lamb, and washed by the word of His testimony. Okay. Father, we thank You for give us the, giving us the examples of Joshua and Caleb. Father, we, Caleb wasn't even a true-born son of Yehuda, but he was grafted into the tribe. He was a Kenizzite. Father, thank You for this message of inclusion of people, who, people whose hearts are after you, realizes that you have loved us with everlasting love. And help us in this day, Father, as we are viewing this portion of Scripture and looking at areas in our lives where, where there are little seeds or little um, things that's taking root in our lives that's maybe not of you. Help us to identify them, Father, so that they can be weeded out and that we can live a life wholly dedicated and focused on you. So that we can be a blessing to one another. And that we can glorify your name wherever we go. And so that we will bring good gifts from the kingdom. That we will bring a good testimony of who you are. And your character. And your attitude towards us. Wherever we go. Help us not to speak the words of Ishmael. Help us not to act in His ways and to exhibit His Spirit, but Father, that we will walk in Your presence and that we will speak words of wisdom and encouragement to one another and so that we will encourage one another to take, to stand up, to get up and to go forward and to embrace the values of the Kingdom wherever we go. We thank You, Father, in the name of Yeshua. Amen.